Hi everyone, welcome to episode 10 of the Business of Aspiration and I have a colleague this time from Academia and her name is Jana Eckhart and she is a marketing professor at the Royal Holloway uh, University of London. I'm very, very, very pleased to have you here, Jana. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Anna. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So a little bit of a background, Jana and I got in touch uh, maybe six months ago when uh, we are interested in similar things. Jana has written extensively about sharing economy, but also about modern luxury for Harvard Business Review and other publications and also so our areas of interest sort of overlap and we talked a lot about what consumers find valuable today, what they want to spend uh, money on and what is experienced economy and um, and so on and i encourage you to google her and to look at the body of her very very prolific work and now uh, today we are going to talk about um brand storytelling and the elements of the brand story when it comes to invented heritage brands what does that mean that means the brand that artificially creates some history behind itself for example think ralph Lauren in the us versus the brand that have that history and that heritage so the question here is of authenticity and can authenticity be achieved in both those scenarios right on to you jana yeah. thanks anna this is such a fascinating topic um so as you mentioned i tend to approach these questions of um, how do consumers perceive a brand to be authentic or not through the lens of brand storytelling? So in other words, um, you mentioned the example of a, a company like Hermes who has actual, um, an actual heritage, meaning hundreds of years of a particular type of production process um, and, and interactions with um, different suppliers. Uh, which go back generations, et cetera, versus a brand like, say, Ralph Lauren, which was started just this generation with, with Ralph Lauren himself. Um, and what the brand stands for tends to be quite different from the background that he had personally. But that doesn't necessarily mean that a brand like Ralph Lauren is less authentic than one like Hermes, for example. Um, I like to um, invoke the idea of transparency in terms of how the brand story is told to make these um, to make these comparisons about which um, which brands work and which don't. So, in other words, um, is is the oftentimes the brand founder, but also just the brand itself. Are they open about? Um, where, you know, why they have developed their brand in the way that they have, what their actual heritage is, and then the different elements of the brand story. So with Ralph Lauren, for example, he has lived, owned, uh, owned and lived on a ranch in Colorado for a very long time, at least 40 years, possibly 50, um, and been very much a part of the, the community. So the fact that his brand pulls from different um, elements that relate to the American West to create um, that, that type of image tends to be perceived as authentic because he has embedded himself in the context. Um, and so I think that's what I mean about transparency in terms of um, the brand elements that are used to tell the brand story. Right, and if we stay on the example of Ralph Lauren, um, when he first sort of started, started weaving that myth, started making the myth of American aristocracy on the East Coast of the United States, the Hollywood royalty, the great Gatsby, that sort of like a uh, New England lifestyle that was invented, that probably people who led that lifestyle didn't completely identify with, that he sort of like translated through his uh, merchandising, through his product design, but most importantly, through design of his stores. When you see like the, the, on the Madison Avenue, the Ralph Lauren house, you, you literally enter the house. So what do you say are other elements to, to convey that 
uh, authenticity of invented story and also uh, is there any other brand that sort of is successfully using you know because now we are seeing the brands for like 1982 like sort of that heritage is 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 you know a brand building element so one brand that i have been studying and writing about recently is the new luxury brand shinola which um they're, they're based in detroit and they I think a lot of people know them for making watches, but they have a very broad product portfolio. I would describe the common element between the product portfolio as um, kind of retro maker type products. So they make um, turntables, for example, they make handmade bicycles, things like this, um, in addition to watches. So this brand was founded in 2011 by the former uh, CEO of Fossil, which is another watch brand that has a similar kind of retro look. And um, at the time, they made a very conscious decision to be located in Detroit, even though that was not where any of the executives were from. Um, and the reason why was they wanted to help to revitalize the city of Detroit and bring jobs back to Detroit because they wanted to make everything using traditional kind of American maker methods. And Detroit has a long history of having those types of factories, which at that time tended to be, um, were, were not used, were unused because that was one of probably the apex of the low point of, uh, of of Detroit's decline. They declared bankruptcy right around that time. The city did, I mean. Um, so Shinola made a very concerted effort to be located there, and they used all of the elements of Detroit in their storytelling. So they would feature the different, um, oftentimes African Americans that they employed in the factories to talk about their lives in the city. And they very much branded themselves as kind of bringing Detroit to life and trying to embody a lot of the cultural symbols, whether it was Motown or General Motors or whatever it might be, but pulling from those cultural resources as they develop their brand. Um, so they got a lot of, um, they've been very successful. They've also gotten a lot of criticism being like, well, but are you really from Detroit? Um, you know, you're, you're pulling from all of our cultural symbols, but aren't you just carpetbaggers who arrived here from Texas and decided to, you know, rather than being the saviors of Detroit, you know, that actually you're doing the opposite. You're pulling from Detroit rather than uh, giving back. And in particular, from a race point of view, a lot of the, the people at the top level uh, of Shinola are white and a lot of people who work in the factories, et cetera, are black. And so it was this idea that, well, you're pulling from black heritage, but you're, um, but you're not allowing that type of heritage to rise to the top and to direct the strategy itself. Um, so the founder, in response to a lot of this criticism, he has said, well, yes, you're right. We are not from Detroit in the sense that we haven't been located here for centuries, but we're trying to be transparent about the fact about why we moved here and what we're trying to do and what our role is uh, within the city. So on the one hand, you have um, uh, a lot of people within Detroit, you know, seeing the brand as appropriating their culture, not necessarily in a positive way, but from when you look at who the target market is for the brand, which tends to be kind of hipsters in global cities, they very much resonate with this idea that I'm supporting a brand that's doing something to help uh, a city that's in need. And so this idea of being transparent about that and the authenticity that comes with that type of goal, that sustainability related goal, in this case, social sustainability, is something that I think resonates with a lot of people regardless of whether you know there has been those hundreds years of heritage within a particular locale for example or not i think that's a great example and i i'm very familiar with that entire story i do also remember that the federal trade commission had forbidden shinola to use made in detroit 
so because they're not made in Detroit so I guess like what are they then doing if they're not even made there if they're produced somewhere else yeah, so the, the term that they have to use now after that Federal Trade Commission um, uh, trial is they use the term built in Detroit. Oh. So what they're doing is they're taking parts from yeah, Switzerland they're... in the case of, yeah, exactly, in the case of watches and from China in the case of some of their other products, and they're assembling them basically in the factories there. Right. So they have to use the term built now rather than made. Made. Right, 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 right. Well, I think like the, the, the transparency aspect is really important. And I think that that is something that is actually missing from a lot of, um, you, a lot of newly invented heritages, invented heritages, if you will, because you've seen the Europe in the past maybe 20 years, 30 years, 40 years with deindustrialization, when actual production of things has been moved to China and off-sourced, they started creating value and basing their growth on enriching things from the past. So they would go and they would say, oh, this region, the poor village, and at the south of France or, some, or, or Provence, we are going to rebrand it. We are going to create around it, so when you buy cheese, it's like made in, you know, from the cheesemongers for they were doing the same thing 300 years ago. Or this, uh, this vineyard is now going to become really, we're going to make it really famous because we're going to put the label, the branding on it. But the transparency there is really missing, I would say think that because the entire thing is the invented story it's not untrue but it's all not necessarily as luxurious as they would like to present it yes absolutely and i think in the end it comes down to whether consumers can access the information that shows that it's not necessarily true or not. So um, a, a great example of this that I love to teach in class actually is the Stella Artois beer. So this is a beer that, yeah, in Belgium where it's from was very much a sort of regular to low level beer, not a high level beer. And when it was bought by the large conglomerate at the time, InBev, um, they decided to make it their global flagship and they invented an entire tradition around Stella Artois as they introduced it around the world as a premium beer. Um, they would give pubs lessons in how to sweep the foam off of the top when you do it from the tap and all sorts of things. They had a pricing policy that if you order it at a bar, it has to be at least kind of 25 cents above whatever the top beer was costing at the time and in a very sophisticated way a lot of people really bought into the idea that this was something that was a premium product and that had hundreds of years of heritage you know as um as as a brand that that uh, was at this was at this very high level and um people didn't really uh realized this for quite a long time, maybe like a decade. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden you started to hear all these stories about, oh, well, I'm from Belgium and this was the cheapest beer we could get when I was growing up. And But those types of stories didn't really make it onto mainstream social media, if you will, till quite a long time later. Um, and so it's really interesting to when so you have these examples of i guess what can be called inauthentic storytelling in that sense um but unless the information is readily available uh, people don't really spend a lot of time investigating these things so it can take quite a long time for that uh, <laughs> that realization or that inauthenticity if you will to surface yeah and my question then is does it make it less authentic then because it's like packaged in such a short period of time and sort of re like retrofitted versus something that's been like 100 years ago. I think that like the, it maybe doesn't make less authentic because the rituals are real. Yes, I agree. I mean, I, I don't think it makes it less authentic. I mean, it... <sighs> I guess you could talk about invented heritage. So in that example of Stella Artois, for, there isn't hundreds of years of kind of, you know, rituals and heritage that go behind it. 
but there is for Belgian beers in general, which is where Stella Artois took a lot of those rituals that they then introduced to all the global cities uh, when they were introducing Stella Artois. So you could say it's invented heritage, but yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call it invented authenticity because I think the people who enjoy that beer and who learn something about Belgian beer history, uh, et cetera, you know, it, it is authentic to them. Right, that's what I'm thinking. Like Raoul Loren is not less authentic because he invented a story. It's, you know, or because he was founded in the 60s, then Hermes is. It's just different ways to convey that authenticity, I guess. Like it's not product quality, it's merchandising, it's not craftsmanship, it's the store experience. So I think that can be like, it's authentic store experience. I mean, if you, if you will. So there is one more thing that is that is a very often used strategy of enrichment, of adding value to things that may be new, adding like the history to them or the story, which is artification. So for example, when, when Chanel wanted to go to China, they entered a new market by opening up a massive exhibition of Coco Chanel's life. And in that exhibition, she was presented not as a seamstress or a fashion designer, but as an artist. So as an artist, in a way that everything, her entire love, life through her school years had some sort of predestination, like the double C was already kind of seen as if she had an epiphany when she was a schoolgirl almost. So, so what do you think about that, that, that strategy as adding value? Because obviously, if you're, when you're buying Chanel, you think you're buying a work of art, you're going to be willing to pay way more than if you're just buying another bag, even if it's a Chanel. It's still just luxury. That's a great question. Um, I think it applies especially to brands which are very closely tied to their founders, which is why Chanel is such a great example of that, because you have the ability when a founder is really well known, yeah, to transform them like that um, in a way that if you have a brand which isn't necessarily yeah, uh, attached to its founder very strongly. Um, you don't necessarily see that. And it's interesting that you mentioned that, that, that the, the Chanel example took place when they went into China. Um, China, you know, being the world's leading luxury market, they are especially drawn to, to that strategy, I think. Um, one of my favorite uh, newer luxury brands is Shang Jia, which is um, uh, started by Hermes in uh, in partnership with some Chinese partners. It's a Chinese-based um, luxury brand. And the founder there, um, she is also uh, very much portrayed uh, using this artification strategy, that she is an artist. And it's just Hermes's, um, you know, kind of heritage in terms of production, which is allowing, uh, which is allowing us to distribute her art if you will. Uh -huh. So I think, yeah, in terms of saying, well, this is a piece of art and we're art, not commerce. We're just using our commerce so that you will be able to access the art, I think is a particularly, yeah, a, a particularly effective way to establish that type of premiumness, in particular, as I mentioned, with founders who are quite well known. Yeah, because that's also a form of myth making in the same way that you make a myth of like French wines or French cheeses or, or Spanish food. It is recently like some, the economy that's so much based on tourism. Of course, you need to brand cities and, and regions in order to attract them to that. So why not people as well? And most recently, I'm curious to hear what you think about this, is that uh, Virgil Abloh had... Um, um, exhibition in Chicago Museum of Art and uh, I personally think that there's the same strategy as with Coco Chanel to turn Virgil Abloh into this renaissance man in order to treat everything that he sort of creates as art or as culture but it's unbelievably commercial strategy and it's very very obvious even maybe more obvious than Chanel since Chanel was done as retrospective she already achieved iconic looks in its own right uh, so wait I have nine minutes. Okay. Uh, so, 
And I think it's also premature to have something like that going forward. And for that, it's not necessarily Virgil Laboulog, but it's actually LVMH being so obsessed with staying relevant. Yes, I think if you think about who the target market is for Virgil Abloh, I think that maybe it's people who wouldn't necessarily think, well, you can't call someone an artist. You know, that's something that history determines over time. Um, but perhaps it is, you know, a younger and a younger audience who is more open to having people be established as icons, you know, within their lifetime and that type of celebrity culture, if you will, having yeah, an exhibition at an art museum, you know, which provides them with, yeah, these, um, celebrity beyond commerce and art beyond commerce, I think is something that the, that, that target segment is quite open to. So in that sense, I think it's quite savvy on the part of LVMH, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting point that that example brings up for me is what establishes authenticity? Is it production or consumption? And what I mean by that is I think in the past, a lot of brands it was the consumption element of it. So even if we think of Chanel, for example, it was about what was the Chanel woman and how was this used? And if you used the perfume number five, how do you feel about yourself and how do you present yourself to the world? Mm -hmm. um, and so it was focused a lot on the, the consumption elements, if you will, rather than, yeah, the what exactly the ingredients were in Chanel number no. five, or well, co whether Coco Chanel herself was an artist or not, et cetera. But I think that there's been a shift and that a lot of kind of the, the, the status and authenticity, if you will, of brands, um, the, the, the symbols and the storytelling for that is tending to come from the production mm -hmm. rather than the consumption now. So whether it's kind of a, a mythology story of where or how something is made, like the Shinola example in Detroit might, you know, be um, illustrative of that, um, or, you know, um, a lot of brands that are arising from the maker movement. Um, so if you see, you know, very expensive uh, craft brew beers, for example, um, that are always talking about, or gins, how they're distilled. Um, so kind of this, this symbolic shift, if you will, to how something is made rather than to how it's consumed or how it makes you feel when you consume it. I think that that's been, yeah, an interesting shift in terms of people's um, uh, in terms of people's authenticity perceptions. And so when I get back to your original example about Virgil Abloh and the Chicago Museum of Art, when you have an art exhibition, it's a focus on what you've produced, right? So you as the artist have produced particular pieces of art that, that are now being exhibited for other people to enjoy and you're being celebrated as a producer. And so I think that marks part of that, uh, part of that shift. Absolutely, and also the museum legitimizes those pieces as pieces of art because if the exhibition took place in a store, they would just be products, but since they're in a museum, they're works of art, just by the, 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 that very context. And um, I think that even Chanel is now moving towards like, oh, rose petals and this specific, you know, like, patch of land where the Chanel 5 is being made and it's been like, you know, cultivated over 300 years and there is specific scents and so on. So I think you're absolutely right about, and I think that that's the, the reason that there is, go, you know, like maybe 50 in the mid, mid, mid last century, it was very modern to buy, to buy mass produced goods. It was not cool to have something that your grandma made or that you bought at the, you know, like your local cobbler. It was more about, oh no, no, I have the same standardized product that I bought in a department store. And you know, that aesthetic, like a refrigerator's electronics, car, even like computer, Apple computer, that's that standardized aesthetic. And now I think that we're seeing the differentiation actually happens through production. That is, you don't want to have uh, and it like the same thing as anyone else has. So where do you think it comes that sort of need to create social distance through production in, in, in people's minds? That's a great question. Um, 
I think so. The, the trend that you talked about, that it used to be very modern to, yeah, have something that was mass produced. I think that the, the shift towards individualization, which has happened at the societal level, um, Zygmunt Bauman has written about this, for example, a lot when he talks about the shift from the solid to the liquid, um, that, that now we are all individuals looking out for ourselves. We have to provide our own health care. We have, all have to be entrepreneurs, finding our own jobs all the time. Um, every aspect of our life, we are kind of an individual rather than a part of society and being provided for by the government or whoever else um, might have done it in the past. Uh, and I think that that mentality in terms of how we have to live now to to exist and succeed within an individualized society also transforms into our consumption as well. So having things that are kind of mass produced uh, where it's not, yeah, that the, the form of production stands out, it's rather that the form of production is standardized, which gives us something, yeah, the same refrigerator that everyone else has, um, uh, but rather it's the opposite. And it's, you know, when you're thinking, how can I, you know, uh, as an individual, um, have my consumption reflect that, then things like, you know, going to the farmer's market and get some, getting some sort of heirloom tomato that it's impossible to get at the normal supermarket or those types of status symbols start, which are more connected to, uh, to the production itself. I mean, something like a tomato as a commodity is the, the most common thing ever. It's something that everyone can pretty much afford and access, but finding one that that um, is special, individualized, has more status because of the way it's been grown and the seeds that have been used. That to me is the ultimate example of this. It's finding something that's a commodity. You could even look at say beer in the same way, but finding some special way it's been produced that in turn gives you this more individualized kind of um, yeah, status or or something to aspire to that's not in the mass produced mold that you described before. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and I have, uh, I think um, Zoom is going to kick us out in two minutes, but I have, I want to add to that. So let me call, like, can you dial back in and I'll just uh, stitch it in a video. Oh, Okay, you know, so I'll just click said, on the... well, It's going to kick me out. I don't know why only at half an hour. It, we have only two minutes. So I'll like call okay. it back because I want to add, um, I want to add something and then okay. I'll just, as I said, edit it yeah. together. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I click on the same link though, right? Same, same. Okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah, speak in a sec. Uh -huh. Bye.